internet, I'm from the internet and my name's Mr Matt and this week we're looking at whether you should get into Magic the Gathering and what resources are available if you do. To start, what is Magic the Gathering? It's a trading card game that's been around since 1993 it's become a popular pastime with well-developed formats, deep gameplay, a robust online and meat space scene, a rich story. It's these individual elements that get players interested, catering for collectors, investors, players or social butterflies. At least you're not going to get any philosophical arguments or debates within Magic the Gathering. If there's one certainty about the human condition, it is that eventually you will do something dumb and I take comfort in that. Obviously, we're all trying our best, but mistakes are coming for you, and that is okay. You're not the sum total of your best and worst moments. You're not an algebra equation. Ah. Most players get into magic via osmosis. A friend usually introduces them, or they see it in passing from looking into other card games such as the Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemans. Although these days, more people are finding it via the new online client Magic Arena. This a huge unbreakable formation. Bang, 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 bang. Everything into the red zone. No profitable blocks here. Yeah, he's got a block for Glagowski. All the fives. This yeah. right here is, is as lethal. He could. Oh. Magic Arena is the most popular way to play Magic quickly with a decent interface and an ecosystem that permits either paying to get what you want or grinding to get what you need. But let's take a quick step back. How do you play Magic? To start, you need to select how you want to play either in the meat space or online in Arena, or Magic Online. Each has its positives and negatives, but for the sake of quickly explaining how to play, we'll go with the Flesh Realm and the standard casual play. Decks are typically made up of 60 cards, with no more than 4 copies of any one card, with the exception being basic lands. You shuffle the deck and draw 7 cards, decide if you want a mulligan, basically throwing back what you have and redrawing with a penalty, before deciding who goes first, usually by dice roll, coin flip, rock paper scissors match, staring contest, hot burrito eating contest, or however you want to decide. You need to end up having mana to end up playing cards. Every single card ends up having its own individual mana cost, and you end up getting mana via lands. Lands such as mountains that I have in my hand right now, and other resources can end up generating mana. Think of mana as sort of like money. You need to end up having money to end up doing certain things, and just like money, you need to end up having mana to end up being able to play cards. Turns are made up of some key parts, upkeep, draw, playing, combat, another round of playing, and then end step. During each of these, multiple things can happen. From playing what is in your hand, getting your creatures to have a bit of a barney with the opponent's mugs, then passing play over to your opponent. One of the main things about magic is that the cards dictate what the rules are. This shifting mutation of what is happening within the game from the cards that are played is what gives magic its complexity and thus challenge. Do you hold on to a counter spell for just in case? Do you swing with everything in this turn and leave yourself potentially open to a counter attack? Combo cards, get stuff from your graveyard, your opponent's graveyard. Do you wait for ages to do anything, looking over your cards, checking the graveyard, looking at the cards your opponent has in play and then just playing a land and passing the turn? All of this is part of the game, which is partly a game of wits and luck as you're constantly hoping to get what you need to win the game and outsmart your opponents. You can understand why this is being seen as a new form of poker, with a lot of strategy being put behind bluffing. You can end up potentially having a terrible hand with no real cards to end up playing, but bluff your opponent to think that you might have a key component in your hand so that they either end up whiffing something or holding back. One of the best options if you are interested is to visit a local game store and say you're interested in getting into magic. They'll typically give you the basic starter decks and talk you through how to use them. Each colour has its own unique playstyle and ethos which will help you pick the colours you'll be interested in. You can learn how to play magic as well via Magic Arena. This has a tutorial system that can end up running through how to end up playing cards, how to end up using mana, and also some basics around colour identity. Another option is if you're on Steam or consoles, you can download Magic Jewels, which is now discontinued, but you can still end up downloading and playing it, and actually learning a bit more about Magic via the tutorials in there. There are a ton of formats within Magic, from Standard, only the latest cards that have been released, a more dynamically shifting game that changes from set to set. Modern, almost all the cards that have been released past a certain point in Magic's history. A slightly more static format that has decks that stay relatively persistent, but evolve as new cards are released and new ideas formulated as a result. 
legacy. Going back further than modern, this stays relatively static, but again has some boat rocking when something gets released that goes well with an older card. Pauper. Almost any card that has been printed in the lowest rarity of common, a cheaper but still fun format. Commander. A 100 card, non-duplicate card format that some say is the expression of what magic is, with a huge pool to pick from. There are additional formats as well, such as Oathbreaker, Brawl, Draft, Pen, Teller, Two-Headed Giant, Six-Legged Dwarf, and many more that are made by fans around the world, so there is usually going to be something for you. Now onto the issues with magic, the main one being the cost in the cards. If you go for a standard deck, it will cycle out after about a year, which, after putting in an investment, can be... Bloody irritating. Let's just say you invest in a playset of some key components of a deck you like the looks of. Most of it will become non-viable. You can move it over to a modern, but chances are it won't fit into a high-level deck easily. You could keep it for a block set, but you'd also need to make sure that you can find others who are willing to play from that specific block. You could invest in a modern deck, but those can get to silly money quickly. Look, like, look at this deck list. Or this one, or this one. Although that's the mad end of the spectrum, and you can invest in a lower-cost deck, these are still quite an investment to make. So where would be a good place to start? Pauper is a good shout, but you need to check out if your group play in the format, or your local game store. Commander is probably going to be the best bet in most cases, you're buying one card instead of multiple copies. Plus, there is a ton of flexibility within the format to craft something unique to you. I have a Commander deck centred on Arachnids, for instance. Others have decks that are focused on certain creatures or mechanics, so you can really end up going to town with what you really enjoy or get out of Magic from just a Commander deck. If you look at some cards online, you can see something that you might find interesting and seeing if there's a couple of deck lists out there, and from there adapting it as you see fit. If you really have a thing for one of the creatures, just chuck it in. So how do you get into magic in a cheaper way that isn't going to cost you an arm and a leg? Well, you can end up going to your local game store, as previously mentioned, and pick up those starter decks. You could actually download the Magic Arena client and go onto there and just not invest anything in there. If you look at Reddit, usually there are a list of codes that can help you get some booster packs and some other little perks that can really help you get a leg up in the early days of Magic Arena. So, how can you get into Magic the Gathering in a fun way? Well, one of the best ways is to attend a pre-release. Pre-releases end up being made just before a set release, and it's an event where everyone ends up opening booster packs and builds a deck out of what they end up receiving that night. It is a little bit of the luck of the draw, however it does force you to think about other colours that you might not have been interested in based on what you end up getting. There are a lot of great content creators out there that can help you get your head around a pre-release, helping you figure out what you need to sort of look for from your packs, and how to build a deck on the night. You only end up building a 40 card deck, however you can either expand this after the event, or see if there's anything else that was interesting in there. You also end up having prizes for participation, and you also end up getting everything logged on Wizards of the Coast website, the Planeswalker Points. Plus, these days you'll usually get something for Arena if you go along, so going from Arena to Meet Reality does have a boost. So what other issues are within Magic other than the monetary investment? There is an overwhelming factor of keeping up with the Joneses. It's basically like jumping into a long-running show and trying to figure out what is happening. If you're new to Magic or had an extended break, then finding out what the mechanics do, what some cards are, and rule changes can be, can be a real hurdle to entry. There are really good points to jump in, and such as the aforementioned pre-release, or with a pre-built deck. But with over 20 years of cards, it's difficult to know everything that will come up. So, how can you get more knowledge? Many Magic the Gathering players turn to the internet. Talarian Community College is one of the biggest sources of knowledge, giving a wealth of information from mechanics, accessories, deck text, construction, and even a skit or two. The professor offers his wealth of knowledge in a comfortable presentation, letting you get better equipped for how to understand the game. The videos are presented in a factual manner and in a well-meaning critical way when required. If you're getting into the basics or want to know more about specific things, digging through the library is a good shout. The professor does have a pen charm for destroying things. So I would recommend searching for a topic in magic you're interested in with Talarian Community College as a view to hunt for. 
So what other elements of magic keep it interesting and worth that time resource we've got limited quantities of? Well, there is a card that's worth over $166,000. Yes, there seems to be a full market of trading within Magic, hence the trading card bit, with rare cards becoming a commodity in their own right. The factors that make up a card's inherent value come down to its strength within the game itself, along with some contributing context in many situations. Cards such as the previously mentioned Silly Money Black Lotus have a value from how many were printed, the ability it gives within the game itself, and the rule Wizards of the Coast have imposed that it will not be printed again. The reserve list is a list of cards that will not be reprinted, ever, well, unless they ever change the rules, which, yeah, would be crazy in another death of magic. The secondary market within magic results in some interesting characters, having some speculating on how a card will either increase in value or see sudden utility, others buying in bulk and waiting to see how it pans out in the future, booster boxes, complete decks, and pre-constructed battle decks, variants of cards and foil versions. There is even a deal or no deal bit with booster packs and boxes where there's an initial value given, but then it can either be higher or lower depending on what's actually inside. You can watch the insanely entertaining Alpha Investments to get this, although it might be a battle of the hair volume between Rudy and Noel Evans. In terms of watching more Magic, you can check out the various streamers online, on most platforms of choice. For official content, Magic now stream most of their tournaments online, over multiple channels. Whilst this influx of new ways to watch Magic is welcome, I do hope we don't get to the stage where it becomes difficult to keep up with all the Magic. I haven't even mentioned the artwork, flavour text on the cards, the books that either go further into the story or theory, the websites exploring theories such as Channel Firewall, videos that go over the lore like Magic Arcanum, hell it even has its own Funko Pop, not that that's saying much these days. So basically Magic is a complex but fun game with a fascinating community surrounding it, with different but equally valid ways of enjoying it. So yeah, weigh up the cost, upkeep and potential chaos of the ban list against the game itself, the surrounding community and the complexity. So. How did I get into Magic? Well, me and my brother used to end up playing a lot of the Pokemon TCG, and when Team Rocket was being released, we thought we'd end up dabbling with a bit of Magic the Gathering. We actually really enjoyed the game, but we felt it wasn't really for us at the time. Um, we just ended up getting rid of the cards, and then many moons later, um, our crew ended up getting into it, the Fondants. So me and my younger brother, and a group of mates all just started playing a Magic around the same sort of time. We all had an understanding of what Magic the Gathering was and just sort of felt that now was the right time to start playing some of the standard format at the time. This was around the second Ravnica block. We just ended up getting into it and playing in our local pub. Um, we all ended up really enjoying it and we ended up finding that more and more of the group that we were going to MCM London Expo, Comic Con, were into it as well. So from there we just started building up a bit more of a, a love of the game. Uh, one of our friends ended up opening his own trading card game store and he's doing really great there. Um, he actually ended up getting my partner into Magic the Gathering by sending her two of the starter decks uh, with a little note on the side of it saying one of us, one of us. As such she ended up getting into Magic the Gathering and she ended up having a couple of little decks herself. Nowadays, I typically end up keeping up with a lot of the things through the creators on YouTube and through a lot of the websites. And I go to these pre-releases every now and again just to end up sort of enjoying a bit of an evening where everyone's on the same footing. So that's basically where I come into with Magic the Gathering. Um, so thank you so much for watching. Have a really great time and hopefully I'll make something again soon. Bye.